Godly Tecaquita being recognized as so good and so holy helps me to realize my call as an Indian to be holy, that I am good, and that I can see God looking upon his creation. And as he looks upon the Indian tribes of North America, God looks at what he made and he said, that is very good. conquest of Mexico, some of the Spaniards all but looked on the Indians they met there as subhuman, and therefore it didn't matter how they were treated. The Holy Father at the time in 1535 wrote an encyclical where he reminds the King of Spain that the Indian people of the New World are truly human beings with rights, and they have dignity they should be treated with respect. In a sense, the French didn't have to have a letter to teach them to treat the Indians with respect. They were imbued with a philosophy that put great dignity on the rights of man as a creature of God, and not merely the people of Europe, but all members of the human race. By contrast, the English people who came to the New World in much greater numbers than the French and who were interested in making settlements all, the, all over the East Coast somehow in the first years didn't care whether the Indians were there or not. Much is made of the beautiful friendship between uh, the pilgrims and the Indians that they found. Well, if that really happened, it wore off quickly because within a few years, the English were killing off the Indians of New, of New England. Theodore Maynard, in his book on the story of American Catholicism, has a much quoted line where he says, as regards the Indians, the Spanish intimidated them, the English ignored them, the French charmed them and treated them like brothers. From the beginning, missionaries came over with the French explorers. First, the Recollets, a branch of the Franciscans. They worked among the various Indian people. In fact, several of the Recollets made the voyage inland as far as Georgian Bay, an arm of Lake Huron, where they encountered, encountered the Huron Indians as early as 1614. In the early 20s, 1620s, the Recollets simply decided they could not do the work entirely on their own. They weren't numerous enough, and they asked the Jesuits of France to come to help them. When the Jesuits came to New France, there were settlements. Uh, what was unique about the Jesuit mission effort was that the Jesuits went out from these mission stations and traveled to the areas in which the people with whom they wanted to work lived. They were very careful to learn the native languages. Uh, and in fact, some of them became quite adept. Some of them uh, had a very difficult time. Uh, the Algonquian and Iroquoian languages that they were learning were very difficult, uh, very subtle, very different than European languages. The Jesuits did not go and teach the Indians French. The Jesuits went and learned the native language. But the Jesuits were unique because they wanted to bring the gospel to these people, and they knew they couldn't do it without understanding their own culture. Uh, a, a, an interesting example of this is the Eucharist. For Catholics, the Eucharist is the actual body and blood of Christ, and it is consumed during the Mass. The Jesuits were very aware that in native custom, uh, warriors uh, at times performed ritual cannibalism. 
and they did not want to confuse one with the other. And therefore, when they preached the Eucharist, they always used the secondary interpretation, which Paul gives us, of a love feast, of a coming together of brothers and sisters to celebrate the common bond of Christianity. Uh, I contend that the Jesuit missionaries of the, in the 1600s were way ahead of their day in what we today we call enculturation. Uh, yes, they didn't have our modern insights, but they did not try to uh, change the Indians. They let them keep their culture. A band of Jesuits came to New France in 1634. They worked among the Algonquin nations. They noticed, however, of all, all the Indians who came down the Ottawa and the St. Lawrence River to trade with them, the ones that offered the greatest hope of evangelization were the Hurons. Hurons were an Iroquoian people related to the five Iroquois tribes of New York State. The Iroquois would have liked to bring them into their confederation, but the Hurons felt they had too good a deal trading with the French. And so this produced warfare between among people who should have been brothers. Just when the Hurons were responding, just when a number of them were ready to turn to Christianity, the attacks of the Iroquois began. And eventually, it would bring about all but destruction of the Huron nation. Many of the Hurons, those that were not killed, were adopted by the various Iroquois nations, Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca. And 20 years later, when the, Mo the Jesuit missionaries had a chance to work among the uh, Iroquois nations of New York State, they found Hurons, now adopted Iroquois, still trying to cling to their Catholic faith. And they, in turn, had an effect on the people who had captured them. So if, in the 1670s, about half the Mohawk people and at least a small number of the other four Iroquois nations became Catholic, the example of the Hurons had a great deal to do with it. By 1670, there was a string of 11 missions, chapels, from the Mohawk Valley to the Valley of the Genesee, where the Senecas lived. My name is Karli de Gakwika. I was born in 1656 in what is now New York State. This is my village, called Ozolono. This is my father. He is a Mohawk chief. And this is my mother. She is a Christian Algonquin. I am four years old. In the smallpox sickness, it's here in my village. It has taken my father, my mother, and my baby brother. The suffering, the death, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. We are moving across the river to a new village called Gatnawaga. My eyesight does not get better. I keep bumping into things. They call me the Gakwika, she who bumps into things. But even with my poor eyesight, I can make moccasins, belts, baskets, many, many things. Nguayat Dizu, my creator, you have truly looked upon me with kindness. We're now 
now going to be entering the fortified Kahnawake or Kognawaga Mohawk village. It is here that Kateri lived. She was baptized here and lived her Christian life here. And we are um, walking actually on ground where these Native Americans lived and where Kateri lived and walked. The archaeological diggings went down about three feet, but the soil was uh, carefully sifted and absolutely replaced so that we are standing now in the original Indian village where Kateri lived most of her life as a young person and eventually she was advised to leave here because it was feared that those who opposed her way of life could very easily uh, kill her. It is Easter Sunday, April 5th, 1676. I am 20 years old. Today I will be baptized. Father de Lamberville is ready for me now. I must leave my village and go north to the land of the Praying Indians. Uh, this is a sh uh, sort of a map of the, the uh, Cattery's trek from where she was born to Karnawagi. The shrine at Orisville, Boselanu, in the Mohawk language, is where Kateri was born, on the south shore of the Mohawk River. Now, where she was baptized and met the Jesuits at, uh, was at Fonda, which, strangely enough, also bears the name Kanawagi at the time, so there must be rapids somewhere in the Mohawk River at that place. That's where she was baptized. Uh, this is not far away from Albany and Schenectady on the Mohawk River. Now, in 1677, she was strongly advised to move to Canada to the St. Francis Xavier Mission at, at Kahnawake up here. She simply moved through up the different rivers and joined the Hudson here and the what we call Lake George today, which was originally uh, the Lac du Saint-Sacrement, the Lake of the Blessed Sacrament. And now we join the Lake Champlain, the whole trek along to the Canadian-United States border. And she turned into a small river, I think it's called the St. Jacques River, that comes right to La Prairie, which is, marks the first spot where the mission was founded in 1667. So in between present-day Kahnawake, Kahnawake, and La Prairie was Cote St. Catherine. And that is a spot in 1677 where she joined the mission that had moved once. This was the first move. And that is where Kateri lived the last three years of her life, and she died there in April 1680 at this spot. I have lived here at Gahnawaga for two winters, and these are my friends. It is Wednesday of Holy Week, April 17, 1680. I have lived on my mother the earth, for 24 years. I am very sick. I have a high fever and such pains in my stomach. I know I am going to die. Soon I will be with my Jesus in heaven. How happy I am that he has chosen me to be with him at last. Do not cry. You see this cross? This cross was the source of all my happiness on earth. I advise you to make it yours. Never stop doing penance for Jesus. I will love you in heaven. I will pray for you. I will help you. Thank you. 
Americans had this idea that there was really one culture and different peoples represented different stages in that culture. And Indian people were primitive, even that word primitive. And they were very at the very beginning. And the best thing Europeans could do for native people was to civilize them, to bring them up to the level of Europeans. The Europeans attempted through particularly boarding schools and through reservations and through isolating Indians and depriving them of their economic uh, subsistence to make them into European American white citizens. The church wanted to Catholicize and, and for Protestant missionaries, Christianize uh, Indian people, but they also saw part of that Christianization as civilization. And so there was a vast network of religious boarding schools. The boarding schools had very detrimental effects. Uh, children were taken away from their parents. Languages were lost. Parts of culture were, were lost because you no longer had that contact to transmit them. Many of the mission schools uh, and the secular schools portrayed a very bleak picture of what native, traditional native life was like. So you had people growing up with this shame for who they were. Uh, all of these had very bad effects. Unfortunately, missionaries could not understand that. They could not understand the spirits the natural spirits of this world that um, Indians in so many ways shared communication with. And what was not obviously Christian and not obviously angelic, the assumption was that it was demonic. And so any communication with or use of the nature spirits of this world where Indians found so much sharing with the world, uh, that was considered demonic and was condemned. And only now we're beginning to see that those forces of nature could be considered as God's messengers. Many Indian people had this power to share and communicate with the, with the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the animals of the, of the plains. And they had that psychic communication in a spirit force. And those spirits could be seen as angelic forces rather than demonic. Now I think we're able to see that more and more. I think uh, the most important thing of my life in coming to the reservation was learning that there is a way of the heart. That uh, from all my training in schools and all my Jesuit training, I learned well to deliver, to develop my, my head and all my thinking power. But when you come on to the res, there's another thing that is taught, and that is the way of the heart. There's great respect for all the powers in the unseen world. Great respect for the beloved ones who've gone on ahead of us to the other world. And all of this makes a unity which brings great peace uh, to my heart. I think in the world I was raised in, there was a great deal of effort to gain control over things and to get a lot of material things. Here, it's the world that we can't see that is most important. It's the, it's the things that you can't quite touch that are all around us that are the most important and the most to be respected because these are the forces that shape all of our lives. One of the things we need to do is to commemorate people like Kateri Tekawitha and to show European people and American people uh, the genius and the spirituality and the depth of Indian culture and Indian faith. And today we have places like Orisville, we have places like uh, Midland. Orisville commemorates uh, Isaac Joves uh, and the martyrs of New York State. And uh, Midland is commemorates the martyrs of Canada, but more importantly, they commemorate the native people of those areas and the faith of the people of those areas. And it's important that these shrines give a just and fair representation of native people and native culture. 
And it's also essential that Native people themselves have a voice in this representation and that Native people participate. If we look at the uh, early martyrs of, of North America and the sanctified of North America, the majority of them are European male Jesuits. One is a woman, is a Native. Uh, there's, there's sort of a disproportion there. If, again, if you look at the uh, Jesuit relations, you discover that the Jesuits are holding up all kinds of Indian men and women who are outstanding models of the faith. Uh, it happens historically that Kateri Tekawitha is the one who is beatified, uh, but there's many of them. If we look at the American church today, we think of the American church primarily as a European and a Northern European immigrant church. Uh, today we're very aware of, of the genius and the contributions of the Hispanic church. We're more aware of the black Catholic church. But probably the last church to be recognized, and ironically, probably the earliest continuous church to be recognized or ethnic group within the church are Native Americans. Santa Rosa Diocese of California. Hoopa, California. Hoopa, California. I think the greatest miracle of all is the fact that we have so much devotion today to Blessed Cattery, and especially devotion in the Tekakwitha Conference. Now, those who come to the conference are over 2,000 people who are delegates, more or less. They are representing right now the 86 Cattery circles that we have throughout the United States. I travel constantly to visit those cattery circles and to share with them what I think, you know, uh, their gifts are, let them know their gifts and how those gifts can be helpful to the church today. Well, this Tecaguita conference took off like wildfire. And there were only about 200, only about one third of them Indian in 1979. But the next year in Denver, there were 600. And the next year in Albuquerque, there were 1,500. And the number of people at this conference has been as high as 4,000. And this coupled with the fact that the Holy Father has named two of the Indian priests of our country, of the United States bishops, this has given our Catholic Indians a tremendous sense of pride. Here, the catalyst, the drawing person, uh, for our indigenous people is Kateri, more so now than before. Uh, before 1980, she was very little known. Then she was beatified. And many of us went to, the, to Rome for the beatification. Uh, different tribes, there are numerous, over 365 different tribes in the United States, but they were all called forth, as many as you could go, to, uh, to go to Rome for the beatification. That was a, that was a sparking moment. You can go to any reservation in this country and you're going to find a statue or a, a, a photo, photograph of Kateri. Uh, while um, she's a young Mohawk, uh, she, uh, her mother was Algonquin like my father. Um, she's transcended her, her roots and become a, a, a Navajo, uh, a, a Laguna, a Zuni. That's the beauty of what, how the church, when the church raises up someone, beatifies or canonizes someone as a model, she then transcends her roots and becomes, for those people, someone to look up to, young and old alike. And that's the uniqueness of Kateri for our country. I feel complete. I feel complete because I'm in touch with all of me. I'm in touch with my native spirituality. I'm in touch with 
Catholicism because I see that it's a way for our people to heal. We have a lot of pain, we have a lot of shame, we have a lot of anger buried deep down in here that is preventing us to be whole, you know, fully who we are, who we're called to be. And I have found that any Native person that gets in touch with that Native spirituality, that presence deep within, in their spirit, they get in touch with that, then a healing starts taking place. And then we start taking responsibility for ourselves. You know, I'm, I'm not um, one to get on the pity pot or to demand or tell people, you know, oh, people owe me this and that. But all of us have to go back and look at our past life. We have to look at our ancestors. We still have to heal from the sins of our ancestors. And here, we all do, no matter what color we are, we have to go back. And one of the sins that has not been acknowledged, is not widely acknowledged, is what has happened to our Native people in their own land. The Europeans, the Anglos that came here, they could go back into their own history and acknowledge you know, what was done to us as the Native people. They put words to it so that we can hear it, so we can feel it. Then we can heal, they will heal, and then we will grow together in spirit.